of the minutes of the meeting of March 20, 28, and April 11, 2012. I move that we accept them as presented. Second. Any discussion? Chief will be working with the Chester County Task Force that's conducting Megan's Law compliance checks. PennDOT has a recouped a request for a nurse left term in the proposed Longwood Firehouse at Nursery Lane, and it's already under construction. Okay. Any questions? Did you have a question? No. no okay. No. Bob, the number of accidents were down various percentages. That covered a 28 or 29 day period versus the year before, or is that not material? Okay. <laughs> All right. Any comments? Well, yeah. well, we just had substantially better weather this February versus yeah. a year ago with less money, yeah. Probably which contributed right. a lot, plus some good efforts to the council. Thanks, Bill. Any questions? I have a few announcements. At the main meeting, I'm going to present the first quarter financials. I'm going to put it on the website the week before so that you can all print it out and get your questions ready. I will do a PowerPoint presentation. The CPA will present the audit in May. A representative from the Land Conservancy will be here in May also to um, let the township know what their plans are for the property they have over here at the corner of Rosedale and Hillendale. It's, they call it the Echo Leap Center. So we've asked them to come in and give us an update of everything that they plan to do on the property. The supervisors will consider adopting an alternative energy ordinance. In, at the May meeting, it's been reviewed by the Planning Commission, the Chester County Planning Commission, and the Township Attorney. The supervisors will also consider adopting a revision to the sewer ordinance. But since the, um, all the sewage goes to the borough of County Fair, whenever they make changes to the sewer ordinance, the supervisors have to make the same changes. This change includes the list and limits list of limits and parameters of influent, effluent, and sludge for the EPA requirements. And there is a 30-day burning ban in effect. The township already prohibits burning. However, mushroom farms are allowed to burn bedboards. The, um, the fire chief has asked us that we put a burning ban on everything for 30 days. The county has one in effect currently as well. And in 2011, the codified ordinance was completed for the township. Right now, we need I need the board to give me permission to direct our solicitor to complete the process by creating an ordinance to adopt it. You need a motion for that? I do. I'll so move. Okay. Second. Yeah. I have a question on yes. Rosedale on that. Um, what do you call it? The Echo Leaf? Yeah. 
Yeah. During the winter, there were four major dumps there, and the dumps are still there. They dumped uh, leaves and compost wood and, chips. and wood chips, and it was pretty uh, messy. It wasn't within accordance with what goes on there. Okay. Is there any way to look into it or why it was done that way? Yeah. It's still there. Mm -hmm. They'll be here next month. You can ask them yeah. directly. All right. I can find out for you there yeah. in the meantime. Yeah. I, I would offer another thought in this. The conservation easement. I'm sorry. I correct myself. I don't think there was a conservation easement. The land was given in fee to the land trust. That's so where they are, that, where that dump was? Uh -huh. That 11 acres from... Incentive mm -hmm. given to the land trust. So I don't know that there are any restrictions on it. There may be. Margo in the back. I can actually answer to that. Um, Margo Taylor, and I serve as a consultant for the land service in Southern Chester County. A little bit of a secret out of the box, but um, part of a grant that we just received. Part of a grant that we just received from Chester County includes putting that parcel of 11 acres in permanent preservation. Under a conservation um, that's that's helpful, Margo. Um, what sort of input from the public might be available for that drawing up the conservation easement? Um, when as soon as it's available, we certainly will make it more public. Thank you. Okay. okay. And then I'm going to skip down to road work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Real quick. Um, Last month, the supervisors awarded road work bids. The, the, the road crews involved in a co-op. There's five municipalities in the co-op, and what they do is, for material, each municipality awards bids for the material. When it comes to in-place services, such as asphalt, paving in place, and um, mill and fill, and then there's also a surface treatment. The co-op awards the bid. Each township is just required to announce what was awarded. So that's what I'm going to read. We don't have to sign the bid. The only thing that happens is the contractor has to send the township a performance bond. But we don't enter into a bid as a township. <coughs> On March 29th, the Municipal Cooperative of Southern Chester County accepted bids for road maintenance, materials, services, and supplies. The purchasing committee of the cooperative made recommendations as to the lowest accepta acceptable bidder in each category. The following bids were recommended for acceptance. Asphalt Maintenance Solutions, that's the name of the company, they were awarded surface treatment as follows. 17,415 square yards of E3M and half inch stone at $1.31 per square yard for a total of $22,918.14. Long's asphalt was awarded paving in place as follows. One and a half inch of 9.5 millimeter PG6422 wearing course in place um, that was a total of $158,599. One inch of 9.5 PG 6422 leveling by the ton at, for 896 tons at $75.25 per ton for a total of $67,424. Two inches of 19 millimeter PG 6422 leveling by the ton for 1,030 tons at $68 per ton for a total of $70,040. Mill and fill base repair, it's 5 inches by 4 feet wide, 25 millimeters, base course by the square yard, it's 8,797 square yards at $25.40 per square yard for a total, which equals $223,443.80. Yes, uh, Joe Duffy. Now, you mentioned eight, 896 tons for some leveling. Yeah. Uh, that's what the tenant has purchased our portion? 
of the co-op bid. Yeah. Suppose we use less or suppose we use more, is there a, uh, an adjustment piece in it? We have to take a certain amount. We can take more and we don't, there's no other penalty to take more, but they won't give us a discount if we take more. Not after the bid's been awarded. Right. So we're obligated for, let's yes. say, the 896, yes. to use 10 more tons to pay the program. Yes. That's great. Thank you. They will be doing the work on Hillendale Road, the paving project on Hillendale Road. Any other questions? Thank you, Lisa. Are you doing with your? Yes. Okay. Um, let, me, let me ask for a second, if I may, Mike. Do we need a motion to accept that, or is it? No, that's already been approved by the expenditure. This is apparently just an explanation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a library board vacancy, and um, go ahead. Uh, we sorry? put Marla Palmer into that position as our second member? I second that. Uh, is there any discussion? Just so you know, Marla Palmer was recommended by the library board to be appointed by the board of supervisors. I think the PC too. And she's also an active member of the DC and they endorsed her candidacy to the library board. No other questions? I move the issue. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. <coughs> <coughs> We have in front of us tonight um, something that we've never done this way before. It has to do with um, an easement, a conservation easement on property in the township owned by Ralph Schmidt. It's on the corner, it's on the southeast corner of Hillendale and McFarland. It comprises of approximately nine acres on which there is a house and a barn and some accessory buildings. <coughs> Ralph has wanted this to be have a conservation easement on it, and it has been appraised in great detail uh, with its highest and best use, which is the definition of the appraisal. It is also the appraisal has also identified <coughs> and appraised the conservation value of the property. The conservation value of the property is based on an assumption that the appraiser made and that assumption is that there are two additional building lots that could be separated and sold separately. The, his assumption is, and this is, this is not to be subdivided, but this is the way the appraiser came to his numbers. <coughs> Three acres would be cleaved off, which would house the home and the barns and so forth, and some of the horse pasture. And then the other six acres would constitute two votable lots. If the value, the procedure <coughs> to evaluate this insofar as how the conservation value is um, established goes through a, a, a rather rigorous process. We have a land evaluation committee here in the township. Um, the North American Land Trust will be a partner to us in this and one of their members is also on the land advisory committee. This conservation easement has been vetted by the conservation Dana. North American Land Trust has been reviewed completely by Bob Adams. Sutter, I know you have taken a uh, interest in this and you have on your own spoken to Bob Adams, I believe. You have also, also spoken to the North American Land Trust to understand where they are. And at some length last Friday, you talked to Ralph Schmidt. Uh, to understand uh, where he is in this. <coughs> this has followed the procedure that the Kennett Township Land Trust established here in the township when they were here before they left. Um, the 
some of the criteria that's used concerns the, the definition of a buildable lot. The key thing about a buildable lot is its ability to perk. Prior to in the days of the land trust here, it was decided that certain soils were very likely to perk. Other soils were questionable. When a candidate conservation easement was identified and it was on questionable soils, we always demanded a perk test. <coughs> In this case, these two fictitious lots, if you will, are on very suitable soil, so we have not asked for a perk test. We have determined that, the appraiser has determined that the value of the two lots is in the vicinity of $470,000. The we, a rule of thumb that we have used in the past, which is very much a rule of thumb and difficult to quantify, is that we might offer as much as half to the applicant. But in this case, we were uh, able to negotiate with Ralph, and we will purchase this for $200,000. <coughs> Now, the agreement to purchase and develop of the development rights and the conservation easement is a document that I have here for approval. I have spent a great deal of time with this. Uh, Bob has spent a great deal of time. You have. Um, and a lot of people have done this. And this has been in the mill for, oh, I'm going to say probably loosely two years. That's about how long it takes. This is not the conservation easement. <coughs> this is an agreement to purchase it. And I would like to move that Kennett Township uh, agrees to <coughs> purchase the development rights of this conservation easement subject to the final review of the details of the conservation easement, which will be drawn up by the North American Land Trust. Is there a second to this? I know there are still some unresolved ancillary issues, but Mr. Smith has been patient for a long time, therefore I will second the motion. And I would move to table it at this time, and Sorry, I will give you the on, on the floor. But the table I think is... Uh, there is a motion on the floor, and we're, we will address that if you wish to table it after the motion is either dismissed mm -hmm. or passed. Then we will entertain that. Well, from a point of order, Mr. Chairman, uh, tabling has superiority over if the motion that is on the table. I move the issue. All those no, I have How about comments discussion? I'd like to make as well. You may make them. I, I, Thank you. You may not make them at this moment because there is no motion on the floor. There's a motion on the floor which is not passed. Okay. I'm not. I'm sorry. We either have a motion. If you're if you're saying I can't make um, a motion to table, then we have a motion on the floor, and I would like the opportunity to speak to it. I'll concede it without arguing further. Go ahead, please. Thank you. First, I want to request that Mike Elling recuse himself from this deliberation, since he has been actively involved in all aspects of his creation. He obviously cannot, therefore, act impartially in deliberations regarding its appropriateness as a township purchase. Second, I note that Mike, contrary to the direct advice of legal counsel, signed the proposed agreement of sale prior to receiving the approval of the Board of Supervisors scheduled for tonight. Third, I want to clearly go on record that I do not oppose the proposed Schmidt, uh, Schmidt conservation easement. I have stated to the board several times and to legal counsel that my concerns are all directed to the procedure that has been followed in this matter and other such conservation easements followed in the past. Without a procedure that is applied to all landowners in the township equally, we are subject to charges of bias and we scare away interested landowners. The hiatus in land conservancy deals over the last several years is testament to this concern. Four, in an effort to address this concern regarding procedure, 
I prepared a proposed procedure for the consideration of the board and emailed it to them earlier today. I offer to the township now and I ask that it be included in the minutes of this meeting. I note that the Schmidt deal was brought to the board, has brought to board consideration through the efforts of Mike Elling, making his further activities in this deliberation inappropriate and a conflict of interest. Further, contrary to the 9-25-2008 procedure for review of requests for using Kenner Township open space funds to purchase easements or fee land, uh, this deal has not required an engineering drawing suitable for subdivision purposes for the number of lots proposed in the appraisal, an indication of well sites for each proposed lot, perk tests on each proposed lot, and all the foregoing to be in compliance with the current Kennett Township subdivision land development ordinances. This is all required according to the procedure for review of requests for using Kennett Township open space funds to purchase easement or fee land and it has not occurred. This transaction does not include for board consideration a final draft of the easement document, nor has an open space management plan, the annual cost estimate, nor drafts of all closing documents been submitted for this deliberation. Both are required by the 925-2008 procedure. The landowner has submitted a summary appraisal report residential dated February 15, 2012. This appraisal is over 60 days old and as such is an invalid appraisal according to the definitions that the IRS mandates. If this board acts upon this appraisal tonight, Mr. Schmidt will lose his charitable contribution, which is half of what the total amount is, thus destroying the value to him of this transaction. I refer you to IRS publication number 561, IRS regulations section 1.170A-13C3, and notice 2006-96, 2006-47, IRB 902. For Mr. Schmidt's sake, it would be wrong to proceed on this matter tonight. Regarding the adequacy of the appraisal, while Mr. Schmidt's property was originally listed on 6-18-2011 for $1.193 million, it has been on the market for in excess of 242 days, and the price has since been lowered to $997,000. Nevertheless, the appraisal uses a value of $1.395 million to calculate the conservancy <coughs> easement value. The price is inflated significantly. In addition, its comparables are inappropriate to the property and the neighborhood. Because of the foregoing concerns, at least, I move that this application and transaction be tabled until the May 2012 Board of Supervisors meeting to allow all interested parties to resolve these concerns so that the easement can go through. And I ask that these comments be placed in the minutes. Thank you. Before we get Question? into the... Jim? Was it, were the funds for this purpose included in the 2012 budget? As part of the expenditures for open space from the open space fund. But the open space fund for 2012 shows zero dollars in the budget. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is, was it included in the budget or not? No. Thank you. No conservation easement is included in a one year projection because it's very virtually impossible to determine when a conservation easement will ripen where we can, in fact, buy it. That's been going on for a long time, Jim, and you may know that. No, I don't. <coughs> um, Scudder, I'm not going to address the details of what you mentioned in, in your uh, presentation. Um, I, I pick on one particular point concerning the date of the appraisal. 
If the date of the appraisal, and I'm not, I'm not aware whatsoever of the 60 day thing that you're referring to. I was afraid that of would, that. That would invalidate every conservation easement that has been put in Canada County. That may be so. Fortunately, the IRS did not discover it. In this case, it's over 60 days. It is not a, a, um, a proper reason of um, appraisal. Uh, don't lose track of the fact that we're not voting on the conservation easement. We're only voting on an agreement to prepare the easement. If the, in the preparation of the easement, they come across many of the <coughs> things that you identified here, they will be addressed. If they're not addressed properly, my motion is clear, and that is the motion is to accept this agreement to purchase the conservation right is contingent upon. And I cannot express it any further that everything that you have mentioned will be vetted and it will be taken care of to our, that is the Board of Supervisors, satisfaction. And I can't say it any further. I don't want to go into any of the details because there are many and voluminous that can be. And based on that, I move the question that's in front of us. Is there any further discussion? Yes, yes. This is, I'm Mike Upton. My question would be, what's the rush? There's no rush. This is a logical progression of a great deal of work that has gone on in the past. There is no reason to delay it. It has been delayed a great period of time, which is not too important, but it's ready to go. And I see no reason whatsoever to delay it. Yes, go ahead. But one of the supervisors has cited a whole raft of reasons that it might not be ready to go. Let's get to the root of those things that he is concerned about by agreeing that we will accept it subject to that those points that he, the stutter has mentioned come forward. I don't see any reason why we should not do that. Let me ask how this IRS... No, it's hardly, it's hardly worth getting into the details. One, one last question. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm just wondering what the Can difference is between... Bill McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering what the difference is between your contingency and the request for motion to table the motion, which does take precedence in Robert's Rules of Order. They're the same thing, and shouldn't we follow Robert's Rules of Order here? Because you're, you're basically saying the same thing. We're only approving this contingent on everything being in order. The supervisor's request here is to table the motion until everything has been deemed in order. I'd rather move forward because this gives us some, some positive progress. <coughs> we will be able to sign this agreement and therefore the conservation easement will be prepared. It will not be prepared until such time as all these issues if we accept the tabled motion because we will not be able to prepare the conservation easement. Margo, last comment please. All right, I'd like to address my comment towards the evaluation. It seems that by the analysis that Mr. Um, I Stevens, pardon, Margo, by the analysis that Mr. Please. Stevens, have you you read read and I have a question, but so please let me give background content to it, please. Mr. Stevens put forward two numbers, three numbers. One, the value of the house at its original sale posting. Two, its current value of the house. Three, the one the appraiser used to value the house. So from that number was created mm -hmm. from the highest number, which was never the actual value of the house, was created the number of $470,000 to say that that was actually the value of the land. Now your motion is the agreement is to actually put $200,000, of which a small portion of it I know comes from my tax money, towards the purchase of this land. And I'm saying if we don't have the correct appraisal, if we don't have the correct numbers, then how do we know it's $200,000? Maybe it's a hundred. 
If it's a hundred, I'm all for it. If we can make a better deal, you've asked your question so, clearly, and I'm going to answer so, it very shortly. So my so question, my question is: yep. Have you read and seen the appraisal? Yes, I have no read and I have seen the appraisal, sir. Then why do you ask questions that are so barely? I ask a question to make it aware to the public. The second the thing is, I know I've worked on a conservation easement. I've worked on a conservation easement in the community. I've worked on a conservation easement in the community where the appraisal was delivered after the signing of the conservation easement. Paying too much. <laughs> Joey, you've already asked a couple of questions. I'll ask your wife, please. Um, we're not married. <laughs> not promoting anything. Mr. Chair, and your um, name is, please. My name is Nancy Arnold. Okay. On, on the matter of on the matter of um, the deductibility of part of um, part of the value of the land for the current owner, I think that the um, Township manager was about to ask a question of clarification. I believe that is new information, perhaps new to the landowner. I would like to hear your question, please. Well, Nancy, I understand where you're going on this. The, the question has to do with the deductibility of the I difference. Think, excuse me, I'd like to hear the question from the woman who was formulating the question. My question was how does the IRS? How does the appraisal work? If you're if you're getting an easement, when are you supposed to acquire the appraisal so that it's valid for their deduction? That's my question. That has to do with the 60-day rule. That that's why I'm asking. Yeah, the I don't question. know the answer. To that. Okay, what? Well, but I can tell you what the answer is. Mm -hmm. You just have to get a new appraisal that is updated so that it's within the 60 days. But the rules are very clear that the outside limit is 60 days. There's no longer a qualified uh, appraisal after the 60 days. It's been 61 days. It was leap year this year. So we've, we're now dealing with a, an appraisal that is out of date. Within the next month, it could be brought up to date. But today, it's inappropriate. And what will happen is that Mr. Schmidt's charitable contribution, the difference between 200000 and 470000 is a charitable contribution. If he loses that 270000 my bet is, I haven't talked to him about it, my bet is he will not be happy. And so that if we go rushing hell-mail down this road for whatever reason not yet stated, I think we do our constituency a real disservice. Are there any other? Um, Joe, you had the floor twice. Mark, I had to go ahead. I, I go have all three floors. This is a different issue. True. And my uh, concern is simply this there's a $200,000 discrepancy between the appraisal and what the property is being sold for. It's a lot more than that. Okay, it's more than $200,000. So, that's a. Sure. I apologize. That's a large disparity. Well, it's not a disparity if you understand the numbers behind it, Joe, and I would make available to you the appraisal where the assumptions going into the numbers are laid out and the numbers themselves are laid out very clearly. Well, if there's an appraisal, um, why would they sell cheap? That's not, um, that's not you're asking me is Hypothetical question because I can't answer. Well, it's for sale for 925000 The appraisal is for a uh, million two, or a million one and a quarter. So, uh, Joe, I, I spent a lot of time with you sure. better identifying the, the assumptions behind the numbers. The 1.395 million number is an, a, a fictitious number. It's used to base other numbers upon. And you will never understand them unless you read the appraisal, and I'm sorry. That just has to be. We have all read it, and Scudder, you know this very well, the numbers. And you understand that the $1.395 million number is a fictitious number. I've said that to you a number of times. And I, want, I, I don't want to go on with this picking the details apart, because all of the points of Scudder, and I'll give you my word of this, Scudder, that if are there are any concerns with the draft conservation easement that this will provide, your, your issues will be resolved. I want to comment uh, on the fact that you tell us that the 
plus, it's actually pretty close to 1.4 million, is a fictitious number and it's based upon presumptions that are in the appraisal. And you told me that many times and I've known that for a long time. I've dealt with these things for a long time. The problem is that the, the presumptions in the appraisal are wrong, I think. And therefore, you end up with a number that is artificially inflated. And that's the reason why I and a number of other people are quite concerned about the appraisal value. It's based upon numbers that are not accurate, and therefore, your false number is worse than false. It's inaccurate.
So I do address this to the rest of the board, and that is, is it possible to proceed with the drafting of the uh, Eastman Agreement, or is it even necessary to do that now uh, with, uh, uh, and, and to sign this agreement now in order to proceed? That's got to make good news. Well, I want to I want to first comment that about the the charges to North American land. Mike has already committed this board in this township to paying um, a sum of money. It has not come before this board and has not been before a public meeting. But we are committed to pay uh, twenty thousand dollars plus ten thousand dollars for the preparation of the the paperwork that's involved. So. That's something that was done, and if this deal came apart, and I sincerely hope that it does not, but if it were to come apart, we would still be committed for time and materials that have been expended by North American Land Trust to get to the point where it would come apart. So, so we are understanding what the ground rules are. That's what has happened so far. Now, if you, if, if you wanted to take and create the documentation, we certainly could do that. We don't have to have all of this stuff uh, by motion already. And the reality is, in all of the material that I have read about conservation easements and about um, how other entities do it, they have all the paperwork put together before it comes to the board for voting. So. Again, I don't know why we're rushing into it, particularly when there are all of the risks to Mr. Schmidt in the matter. No, no, you, had, well, you were just uh, deliberating with uh, Mr. Hanifer there during a public meeting. And, and uh, you know, we would like you to deliberate in public. I wanted to know what you were telling us what you were talking about. I'm not sure I have to do that, Joe. <laughs> yes, you do. I have sunshine. Yeah, I want to know how much more time we should allow. Are you satisfied, Joe? Uh, I was reading your lips. It didn't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, why don't you question Mike Sutton to start that five minutes before? I can see it. Oh, you shouldn't do that. I, I have a question. The first thing, I'm sorry, you are. I'm Shirley Weaver. Okay. The first thing that Scudder said was that you refused yourself. You didn't answer that. I didn't intend to. But it looks like since you already went ahead and did things, that Scudder Stevens' point. Is well taken. Well, I don't think it is, and that's why I, I, I will not reduce myself. And that's my own opinion. Is there anything else back right here, please? City of Auburn, Kenneth Township. Um, reference is made to paperwork that you signed, and with the possibility that it was signed illegally, improperly, or, or not in the correct time and it's following the correct process. If you if that has happened, and you've done that, are you then personally liable for those I funds? I don't know. But let me explain or why. Do we, does the township have to pick that up? I, I couldn't answer that in the slightest. Let me explain why I initialed that original agreement with the North American Land Trust. They were on tender hooks wondering where this thing was going. I gave them some confidence by doing that. But I said to them, this would not be valid until it was vetted in a public meeting. Is that right, Steve? Correct. So, so then we don't owe them any money. John, May I ask me? why it is that you signed the agreement of sale last Thursday, even though the board and legal counsel told you not to do it? John, you had a question, please. Can we have an answer to that? Why not? Answer. That's not accurate. Sam, please. Correct me if you would, Mr. Allen. When was it signed? When was it signed? John, would you go ahead, please? <laughs> uh, it, it sounds to me like, with all this discussion, is John Hendrick, Kenneth Townsend, that uh, 
most people here, including myself, do not understand what the motion is at this point. But so the thing that I'm hearing is that all three board members are in favor of this thing being successful. That's right. But there are so many wrenches being thrown around that it sounds to me like it's highly likely that it will not be successful if we continue in this process. If, as this gentleman over here suggested, that essentially you are approving twenty or thirty thousand dollars to draw up some legal agreements which will be reviewed very meticulously, I imagine. That is, seems like a reasonable thing to do, and maybe you can take that one small step. But I don't understand what your original motion was 45 minutes ago or so. <laughs> maybe you could review what the motion you. is. The motion was to approve the agreement for the purchase of development rights and conservation easement for the Smith, Smith property subject to final review, final review. And I didn't say it in the motion. The final review will consider all questions and issues that have been raised tonight. But that also authorizes a certain amount of money to be paid to this it, it does. It will pay them up to a certain amount of money, $20,000, to draw the conservation easement. And once it's approved, if it's approved, put it into effect. They won't get any of that money until it is approved and put into effect. One, one last follow-up. Mm -hmm. Will there be another public discussion of this final agreement prior to uh, executing we it? We haven't thought about final? that, John, but that's a very real possibility. Yeah. Mr. Elling, I would like to comment on what you just said. The fact is what your motion is asking us to do is to sign an agreement of sale. That agreement of sale will be binding on this township and on North American land and on Mr. Schmidt. The only thing that is open for discussion after the fact is if we have the right easement. Uh, we have nothing to talk about on the basic deal. It's done on the money and all the terms of it. So to suggest there'll be a second pass at it, I think is uh, disingenuous at best uh, and doesn't deal with the reality. If you were going to sell your house and you signed an agreement of sale subject to getting um, uh, a termite inspection, you're bound to sell your house. Otherwise, you're in breach of contract. That's what we're looking at here. Yeah, I want a clarification. I heard a number of 20,000 30,000 more. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I want the clarification is, did you commit to that by yourself without the other two supervisors? Jim, I thought I just mentioned that clearly a moment ago. I initialed that contract to satisfy the North American Land Trust that we had serious interest in this, and I made it subject to <coughs> a full approval at a public meeting. Was that uh, approved by the three supervisors? Mm, it didn't have to be.
put it quite clearly, I think, and that is that all three of us are in favor of this conservation going forward. It's perhaps a means or a question of how yeah. and in what form. Yeah, much. No, we haven't talked too much about that, but that will be everything that is in this potential, this agreement to purchase the development rights is open. It will be reviewed, and it's everything in here and the conservation board is subject to review. No, I'm not going to fall on you. That is patently not correct, Michael. That is patently not correct. That's part of my motion. Why is that not correct? If you sign that agreement, the agreement controls, but for the very few things that need to have um, final documentation of. But the agreement and the commitment is a done deal. And that's what this whole discussion, I believe, has been about. And it's all because we're making a headlong charge to the cliff. Not at all. No. Okay, no, I'm not I going to call the question because I think we've exhausted this uh, in detail. No. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. No, we haven't. Point of order? Yes. I believe that the motion to uh, table this activity takes precedence over your motion. So I think you need to get back in Robert's Rules of Order and do this correctly. Am I correct? Yes. Yes, you are. Therefore, the motion to table is, is on the floor. All those in favor of tabling it? We'll have discussion about it. We haven't had any discussion about the motion to table. I'm running out of patience. So are we. Robert's Rules of Order. Go ahead, please. You had your hand up. Yes. I would like to know, now that you're discussing the tabling of the motion, exactly what the consequences, if any, negative consequences of tabling the motion would be. As far as I'm concerned, there would be very few serious consequences, except it is ready to go and it has been it has been vetted thoroughly, in my opinion, obviously not in Sutter's opinion, but it has been vetted very thoroughly to the point where we can see reason to accept this with conditions. But tabling it would have no serious effect on the process, right? It wouldn't get it. It wouldn't get the work done that we have to have in order to vet the information easement. I think I explained that before. Yes, and what would be the consequence of that? We won't have anything to talk about. <laughs> that would be nice, actually. Well, sir, that comment suggests that you don't want to show up, because it wouldn't be nice at all. It would defeat the entire understanding of the Any other questions concerning the tabling of this motion, please? And identify yourself again, if you would. Ms. Klein. Thank you. Ms. Klein. Um, along that same line, if it doesn't go forward, I just get the impression, and is this correct, that there'll be all those conversations going again that have already taken place to establish the, the 1.395 and the 470 and the 200 and the... So it just seems to me that, and, and a section <coughs> and an appraisal, it sounds like all of that will be going, or churning and churning again. Well, it may or it may not. Um, the actual number, the dollar amount, can vary with an updated appraisal. The assumptions appear not to be able to be changed because it's the fundamental part of a conservation easement. If that's the case, if the numbers change, then we will change everything that are based on it. That's really all I can say without knowing what the new appraisal might say. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> Aren't we committed to the 200 though? Once we approve that. Subject to. <coughs> Would you please show me the language in the agreement of sale that says what you just said, Mr. Elling, please? I don't have the language, but it's in the motion. 
It was in the motion, the question that he was asking. But it's the agreement of sale that binds. John, did you ask, have a question to ask? Yeah. John Warner, I'm a member of the Land Conservation Advisory Committee. And just, just a brief comment. Uh, I think we have three people that have a disagreement on procedure, but have a goal in mind. The gentleman asked, what are we likely to lose? And I think what we're likely to lose is, is Mr. Schmidt's patience. So if we don't proceed, I'm not saying necessarily tonight, if we don't proceed in a consummate fashion, we're going to lose a valuable easement. That's what we have to lose. May I clarify what I said? I think that no one on the board is suggesting that we don't proceed in some form with this process. I think the motion on the table that we're discussing is whether it should be tabled for one month and whether the issues that have been brought up here, including the fact that the uh, current assessment is invalid by virtue of state, no, by virtue of state, okay, uh, be resolved prior to moving ahead. And that's the only thing that's on the, ta that the tabling motion is moving forward as far as I can see. Exactly. It's not telling Mr. Schmidt we have no intention of doing this, okay? It's not seriously delaying anything. No one has put some time limit uh, on getting this done. Uh, and so I, I fail to see why <coughs> the motion to table shouldn't carry. Um, you've just heard what John Marmon has said. John has talked a great deal, uh, some to Ralph Schmidt. I have talked to Ralph Schmidt repeatedly. Um, Ralph has shown a great deal of patience in this, and I didn't mention this at all in any of the conversation germane to this subject tonight. But Ralph is tired of this. He has been pretty well jerked around, and I don't want to go into it, but that's something that is emotional and is non-quantifiable, and I didn't really want to bring that up. Jeff, do you have a question? Please? I just, I'm confused now. This easement process has been brought to light in the last 30 days? No. He's tired of being jerked around for 30 days? No. Uh, Scudder was not, and the rest of the board was not aware of it. What, what has jerked him around for all this time? I mean, if we have a set of rules and regs, he complies and we do it. We want to conserve land. I'm confused. I mean, I, anytime someone wants to really quickly close a sale, that means that I better examine the details again. And that just seems that this is a rush because yeah, he's getting nervous. Have you been in a meeting with Ralph Schmidt Friday that lasted a consider considerable amount of time? Um, Ralph, in my opinion, and I really don't like to do this because he's not here to confirm it, was showing a great deal of patience. But there were times when he also talked about how long this is taking. And you were there, and I think you heard that as well. That was the reason why I was concerned that you've been dealing with this for two years. I've been dealing with it for one month, and the paperwork that was given to me a month ago was dated in January. So there were two months prior to my getting it that you had paperwork. You kept me from getting it. And you, you've been working on this for two years. So I'm still agreeing with what Jeff said. Steve, can you proceed without the signed agreement? Yes. So what, what happens That's if the agreement is not signed? What, what is it that's the signed? agreement of sale or the conservation easement? No, this agreement is not signed tonight. That agreement is between the township and Ralph Schmidt. But you can do what you need to do to prepare the easement. Sure. This isn't holding you up. Thank you. All right. That's what I wanted to clarify. That's excellent. Thank you. That's good news. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
by promoting efficient multimodal transportation options for this traveling within and through the byway. Can you and I, that's a heck of a mission. A few of the uh, outcomes and benefits of the byway, so that, you know, if this goes through, and right now, really what we're just looking for is a general understanding of what it could be. There is, you know, the byway doesn't exist yet. Um, this will be the first bi-state watershed-based multi-municipal byway in the United States. Some of you might be familiar, there's been an effort going along <laughs> on the Brandywine Valley to create a um, similar bi-state byway. There, the one in Delaware would adjoin and connect to this proposed extension of the roadway system into uh, Pennsylvania within the Red Clay Creek watershed. Formation of like-minded coalition, uh, coalition um, determined to protect and manage resources regardless of state or municipal boundaries. Quarterly or semi-annual meetings with uh, the Delaware um, Red Clay Valley Scenic Byway Alliance so that there is um, the opportunity in the future to actually have a group that oversees to be sure that these intrinsic values and qualities are preserved and protected. So it's another set of eyes and ears that are going beyond just municipal boundaries but actually across state borders as well with similar qualities being protected in Delaware as that will be protected in Pennsylvania. Recognition by PA that the resources are unique and worthy of preservation. We all live in this township. I think we all know that one. The quarter management plan will be a guide to future preservation and enhancement efforts. The outreach materials, presentations, brochures, websites to educate stakeholders about the importance of preservation efforts and promote and educate the people that live here. And finally, the potential of, um, I don't know what the MOUs, um, with other agencies such as PennDOT regarding road maintenance improvement projects. I just think it's a matter of being able to coordinate with those who might have a different attitude, like we have a right of way, we want to keep the power lines open, we're going to take the trees out of that power, you know, the, um, from underneath those um, power lines. Well, the quality of the landscape has changed by the removal of the trees, so can there be some way that, you know, there can be a little more communication <coughs> between the agencies that regulate that. Um, so, let me just clarify. So, you know, again, just interested in looking from the Board of Supervisors right now, we've gone already, the committee has gone all the, already before them, we were appointed by the <coughs> Board of Supervisors, asking for their, you know, commitment in terms of, you know, encouraging the, um, the alliance to move forward with actually putting in an application, and that's really all it is. So what we're looking for is that this meets the um, cons you know, approval and consideration of the supervisors, is, is that they consider doing the same again in the future. Now I know that there is a particular concern of one of the members of our committee in regards to the adjacent and location of this byway to the Brandywine Scenic Valley Byway. And so that there has been some discussions with PennDOT specifically about that. And I know that the um, commission is going to relook at that. Um, and so the important thing is to be sure that, you know, both commissions feel, or one commission and one alliance, feel that, you know, these will be mutually supported um, efforts that will at the same time not disintegrate or um, reduce the value of the other byway. Um, did I get that pretty well, Tom? Second? Okay, and I'll, I'll give you a chance to step up a second. And the last thing is just a request to the, um, the Board of Supervisors to continue their support. If we do go forward with that, there's a official form or official letter that will help the supervisors draft that would address that statement. Resolution. Resolution. Do you want to say Before you go, may I ask you a question, please? Certainly. Would you give us a timeline for what needs to occur? Because if I understood what you said, uh, it's a fairly short one, uh, and something has to occur within the next 45 days. Can you clarify that for me, please? Yes. Um, we will need an opinion by the Board of Supervisors at their May meeting, because it will be mid-June that the Red Clay Valley Association needs to have collected from all the partners, all the municipalities involved in this effort, to have a resolution that actually supports the move forward, which is just in the drafting of the application. Okay, so that would be 30 days. So you need a resolution. 
Correct. Margaret, would you provide? <coughs> yes, I do believe there's draft <coughs> language and we'll be sure to put that forward. Do you want to speak further, Tom, about? Uh, uh, I also serve on the uh, Grand Mount Valley City Byway Commission and we really haven't we really haven't had a chance to discuss it in our monthly <coughs> meeting, which is next week. I've sent a memo to all the members uh, giving them a basic outline, but after our meeting next week, I'll have a better feel for how the uh, Brandywine Valley Scenic Byway Commission feels about having another byway that joins into ours along uh, Route 52 and such. But uh, Margo's right, all we are going to need next month, friend, is just a resolution that you will continue to support. No commitment for monies or anything like that. Good. Now, <laughs> All right, that's it. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Margo. Okay. Thank you, Margo. Just a question, Margo. Okay. Margo. Margo. How much of the that uh, scenic byway that you're talking about is will be located in Kennett Township? I do believe it's between 60 and 70 percent. Okay. Just curious. Thanks. Of what? Of the proposed road that is to be integrated into the byway by in Kennett Township. You have it by mile. I don't particularly, sir. We can find that information for you, though. And there's a map, etc. Okay, we're moving on in our agenda. We're coming to the road work with current activities. A small, small subdivisions have been swept by our road crew to cut down on our contractor cost for that sweeping. Two new berms are being built at our recycling center on days that we have time and material to do so. These berms will be in the adjoining lot where we have the large brush um, pile. A new employee was hired after a long interview session. We had 47 applicants for that position and the employee started today. Bids were opened by our co-op co and that's been discussed with Lisa just moments ago. Shoulders on some township roads have been uh, redone. As time frees up this summer, we would be doing more throughout the township. Skin patching was done in the township using our co-op group. Spring cleaning was held on March 24, and the township plans to, and we did a very good job in cleaning up some of our roads. It was a great turnout, and we thank everybody. The road was. Uh, road inspection was held on April 10 of this year, which road inspection is done twice, and the roadmaster and all three supervisors were in attendance and we visited almost all the roads in the township. <coughs> Our salt barn is full for next year, even though we didn't use a lot this winter. We needed to accept 60% of our bid amount. This is normal for every year. Our first round of mowing could be early this year due to the good weather that we've had. Mm -hmm. We will monitor that cutting uh, as we need it. Any questions on the road report? Okay. Um, extensions. We have an extension for the beta cap property until May 30, and we have an extension request from the ham property until August 29, all of 2012. I move we accept these extensions. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any other business? I have no other business. I do. Okay. Mr. Okay. Mr. We have a motion to revise the township records security policy. Whereas in December of 2011, the then Board of Supervisors amended the records security policy by providing that not even members of the Board of Supervisors are permitted to access personal information, human resources. Whereas I believe that this extraordinary step was taken solely to preclude my access to township records. Whereas I had then and still have now a right to know claim against the township for access to the financial records of the township. 
The word on that action now pins in the Court of Common Pleas of Chester County and is scheduled for trial in mid-May of 2012, a month from now. Whereas that right to know action has so far cost the township approximately $100,000 to defend and will cost additional thousands of dollars to prepare for and present its case in chief in May. And whereas a duly elected supervisor of this township, I have a right and a duty to oversee the financial activities of this township. And whereas I, like the other supervisors of this township, am personally responsible and liable for the financial transactions of the township and their appropriateness. And whereas one of three individuals who act as owner of this business, the business of the township, I am responsible for the activities of this township, including the oversight of all financial and personnel matters. Whereas I have, in fact, been given the opportunity to review the financial records, including personnel records of this township in the past and into the future, whereas I have offered to settle or withdraw my right to no claim against the township in consideration for the removal of the offending language found in the township records security policy, and whereas the two other supervisors of this board have steadfastly refused to enter into this agreement proposed by me at great financial cost to the township, as well as to me. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the last paragraph of the township records security policy adopted in December of 2011 be amended to read, and I'm taking the last whole section uh, which is identified by the last black dot. Personal information, human resources. The township manager, secretary, treasurer shall have primary responsibility for personal information and personal data and health insurance information, including access thereto. Duly elected supervisors shall also have access to said information and data. No other employee or volunteer other than the township manager, secretary, treasurer, and duly elected supervisors shall be permitted access to this information without the prior approval of the township supervisors. I so move. Is there a second? Motion is denied because there is no second. For you, you understand better that this is something brand new that we've just received as you pass it out. That piece of paper is brand new. I've been talking with the board for several months about this situation and have made proposals to solve it. And so far, Zippo has happened in response. Why don't we wait until the court decision is? Well, the court decision only has, so far, only has to do with my right to know as a citizen. It has nothing to do with my right to know as a duly elected member of the Board of Supervisors. And that will not be, at this point, will not be addressed by the, by the, the judge. Are there any other comments? Go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to. Cindy Faulkner, Township. Why is it that Mr. Hamaker is permitted access, but Mr. Stevens is not? Can you help explain? Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's correct. Wait, wait, wait a minute. That's yeah. not true either, though. Hold on. Folks. First of all, all the supervisors have access. The problem is, per the civil rights law, I cannot give out personal identifying information of our employees to anybody. If you look on the civil rights website, you can see that I can't give that out to anybody. Well, my, my employer has personal information on me. Right. And, and they're responsible people, for it. Right, right. And and as I see it, Mr. Stevens and Mr. Hamaker and Mr. Elling are the employer here on our behalf. They act as the employer on our behalf. On behalf of the citizens, because these people. There is no employer employee relationship. Well, it's, a, the it's, a, congru it's a congruent relationship, correct? It's not an so employer relationship. So we, 
we can't expect that everyone in the township is going to administer the pay rises for the people on the township payroll. That's why we have these three people up here to do that. That's correct. So why is it that they're not viewed as the employer and why is it that they're not permitted access to the information? They're, they're permitted access to all financial information except personal identification information. It's not my law. Right. So, so, for example, are we talking about things like the HIPAA health law? So yeah. Yeah. Yes. I can't, I can't give out people what I pay for people's health insurance. But you can, re you can redact anything having to do with their personal condition or anything that is. Correct? That's part of the law. Well, you know what? Maybe I have a suggestion. Why don't we get our township attorney here to explain the right to know, to explain the law? Because I'm not an attorney. I'm just following the law. So, how about we get our attorney here to explain it? So, Mr. But Mr. Ellen doesn't have access to this information. No, I have personal identification not. information now. Absolutely but Mr. Not. Stevens have the same access to the information that these two gentlemen have. Correct. Give yes. everything. Absolutely give everything. True. Anything he would ask me for yes, that I can give him, other than that information, I would give him. And he has asked for some of that information, and he has been given it. We all get to be ignorant. Is that the idea? We all get to be ignorant. Is that the idea? Well, you're following the law. That's what you're doing. No, no. The, the law is that employers certainly have the right to know what is going on with their employees. And with all due respect, this Board of Supervisors has the power to fire somebody just like they have the power to hire, hire somebody. How can we do that if we don't have access to the information? We are not just volunteers. I know there's an issue about the right to know. I disagree with the position the township has taken. As to me, as a, as a citizen, just like the position it would presumably take for you. But I am not just a citizen with all due respect. I'm a supervisor. And by taking away my right to look at that material, and I'm not looking to find out somebody's personal information. I want to see what's going on financially. This township has been through tremendous difficulty in the last six months, and we now are getting three audits done to make sure that things are done correctly. Why? Because the supervisors have not looked at this stuff and followed up on things in a proper, I submit, a proper fashion. That's all I'm trying to address. That's my responsibility. And if something turns out wrong under my watch, I'm personally liable. So if I'm personally liable, why can't I see it? That's my problem. But my point is that there is no discrimination. One isn't discriminating against you. It's just what's happening with the law. That's correct. No, Thank it's not much. by the law. No. Okay, okay let's go to the law. I'm sorry, we're not, we're not getting anywhere here. Let's go to another subject, please. Do you have something yes, to say? Yes, well, I, mean, I have something to say on this issue, yes. Uh, actually, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Scudder, has there already been a court case on this matter? Um, I have not seen one. None has been cited to me. Uh, as far as what? As far as the right to know, well, or as the far it, as the supervisor's right to know? Isn't the isn't the um, isn't the township appealing some previous decision? Well, yes, it was. It went to when I made. Again, I have to make the distinction. My motion only deals with with my position as a supervisor. Okay. The right to know has to do with my interest as a citizen. Now, when I made an application for right to know about just short of a year ago, 10 months ago perhaps, um, it, w it was turned down by the township. I took an appeal to Harrisburg. It was fully vetted through <coughs> by the officials in Harrisburg, and I won that question on the right to know. And that is what's under appeal at this time. But that's, again, different from what my motion is about. And my motion is about what I, as a supervisor, have the right and the duty and the obligation to be able to look at. So the, so the monies that have been spent on this case were spent not relative to your rights as a supervisor, but relative to your rights as a citizen. Is that correct? Well, to... Yes, that is correct to the extent that in January 
I propose to counsel for the the township that we settle this by just removing the offensive language in the in the um, township records security policy, and they have refused to do that. So therefore, there has been great expense incurred. When they could have settled the case, they continue to keep it going. That's the, that's what I'm saying. And, and excuse me, but prior to the um, prior to the uh, uh, December, I think it was a December motion that created this uh, security uh, wall. Um, what was the status? In other words, what could uh, supervisors see or not see here in this township prior to that security? I don't know. I wasn't a supervisor right. then. I don't know what the practice was. So why? So why was this thing enacted in December? What was? What happened uh, that would cause this to be enacted just prior to your coming aboard as supervisor? Well, as I said in my motion, I believe, but this is just my guess because I wasn't there. But I believe is to continue the the desire to keep me from being able to. Um, be actively involved at that level with the business of the town. And prior to that, the other supervisors weren't subject to any such restriction, at least according to the security policy of the township. I guess we might. I don't know. I guess we were. Let me make a very clear point to you. If Lisa has acquiesced to Scudder's request for that kind of information, she would have been doing an illegal act and she could have easily been fired. I don't think I can say that any clearer to you. So what was the, what was the purpose of the December clarification? We, we had a records policy in place. It was, it was just amended, I think, in That's December. All. So, so just a question, I'm sorry then, just to understand. So who, nobody has access to any Nope. Information no, on any hiring or any firing or any. The only information <coughs> that is prohibited from supervisors <coughs> is that information of a type of personnel information. A type of personnel information that is controlled by the HIPAA. Uh, I can find out someone's appraisal, performance appraisal. I can find out a lot about an employee, and so can every one of us here. It's privileged information, and I don't think it's something that the public would want or yeah. need to know. But if we were going to fire someone, we have to go through a great deal of explanations as to why to do it. We have done that in the past. It is a very difficult process to fire a government employee. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm just really confused. What? Um Mr. Stevens, could you explain what type of information you're trying to get access to that you feel you're being denied? I'm sorry, it's just not really not clear to me. The policy as it now reads, the township manager, secretary, treasurer is the only person permitted to access information that is considered personal information, personal data, and health insurance information. No other employee or volunteer, including the Board of Supervisors, are permitted access to this information. I believe that as a supervisor, I should have access to that, as well as the finances. That's, so I have the finances. So, so okay, but I don't have well, I don't think the we're larger volunteer, picture. But why don't we get yeah. somebody who's an expert in the right to know right. say because. My concern is I don't want to violate the law by giving out personal information. And if, I, and if it's health insurance information or personal identifiable information, I do not want to do that because I've already talked to the Office of Civil Rights. Yeah, I think we're obliged so to give her some support on this I, I to make sure that she's protected. We, we, the solicitor reviewed our policy and said there's nothing wrong with it. That's right. I'm just suggesting to resolve it, let's ask the right to know attorney yeah. and get to the bottom of it. I agree with that. That's that. all mm -hmm. I'm saying. Okay. Because okay. I can't, I'm yeah. not an attorney. I'm just following what That's correct. I read by the civil rights and what our attorney told us. Now, our attorney's not a right to know expert, yeah. so we need a right to know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to know 
this hundred thousand dollars that's being spent for a trial, is that coming out from our town for money? Why? What's the where did reason? that hundred thousand dollar number come from? And that was the number that I was calculating um, as to what it cost. So I'm looking at what it has cost, for instance, tonight's bills will include $5,000 to counsel on the right to know. That's for now. And we haven't gotten to trial. I, I, none of us have seen that number, the details of it, so it's just sort of a simply a wild basket. A lot of money. Well, what do you with that? Yeah, the question yeah. is, though, I, my understanding was that some money spent were to get a decision that the answer was already known that the regular citizens in this township don't have the right to look at that information. That's uh, not that. I, I meant something to <coughs> that. I'm not sure I understand. That there was a decision made that it's exactly true that a citizen in the township has no right to look at the information. That's, hold on, don't mm -hmm. that's, that's another thing. That has nothing to do with this. Oh, okay. and, 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 and a citizen has a great deal of rights to look at a great deal of information. So would the board agree that we do that? Yeah. I don't like this ongoing issue and it really puts me on the spot. Yes, it does. Because mm -hmm. I'm responsible for this information. This has been going under the general direction of our legal counsel. And wherever Bob Adams has needed to go to with someone else to get information, I must assume he has done that properly. So when Bob tells us, tells Lisa, a legal issue, she's obliged to accept it as she hears it. And that's really all I can say to you. I, I, I have a great deal of respect for Bob Adams. He's been doing this work for eons. And if, if, if it's the will of the folks here to spend the money to find someone, a specialist, <coughs> this kind of thing, uh, we will do it. I think as long as the goal is, if the goal, if the goal, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I agree, if the goal is resolved, yeah. but the mm -hmm. goal, I think, is to give very, to outline very specific type of information mm -hmm. and and get it down on the record so she knows exactly what she can't disclose. Mm -hmm. And then everything outside of that then yes. becomes Absolutely. Becomes visible, becomes visible to the supervisors, right? Mm -hmm. Someone back here, please. Yeah, hey, uh, I'm, I'm Brian Gore, um, and I'm a resident. Uh, could you please explain, I think there's a lot of confusion as to what, what the crux of this matter is, and it really revolves around the QuickBooks and electronic information. Yeah. Um, so that's not correct. It, it does, that's the not right correct. to know okay. question has to do with it's the ability the to redact information in QuickBooks. Right. This motion has to do with my rights as a supervisor to look at the information of the township in its totality, since I'm responsible, along with my two brethren, uh, in its totality. And this has nothing, I want to make this really clear, this has absolutely nothing to do with Lisa Moore. This is no. not ish directed at her, this has to do, my motion was very specific, it's the other two supervisors that are controlling this. Lisa does not. I understand. So it, so there are two separate issues, as, as you said, uh, but you're right as a citizen. Um, what's being appealed, as I understand it, in the court case is the QuickBooks question, and and it and you have the right to all the financial information as I think everybody else in this room does too. Uh, there is so there's the paper trail which is the checks, which everybody has the right as I understand it uh, to request to look at the specific financials where it comes to checks written and. Uh, and, and transfers from accounts. Is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's true. I don't know if it is. Yeah, it is true. We, we have, we have so. the right to look at the, the checks. You do, I do as a citizen. Right. Yes. I, just, I just want to clear that if anybody ever you wants to look at specific please. financials, uh, checks written, transfers made, that is all public information as I understand it. That's yes. correct. It is. And, and if we got a right to know attorney, to determine what I'm allowed to disclose.
disclose to the supervisors as far as personal identifying information, it will resolve a couple issues. I'm sorry, but behind you, someone was very patient. Yes, my name is Norman Dean, Cedar Cross Road. Has this been compared with other townships, and mm -hmm. what problems are they having? I, I have asked other townships if they've had this issue, and they haven't. So, so I don't really have much direction. Okay. Uh, Mr. Scudder, um, have you tried to negotiate with the uh, council for the township? With council? Yes, sir. Yeah, I did that uh, um, after the election, uh, and once I was in a position to do that um, in January, then I began those discussions, and I was told that, that the uh, the board didn't want to go there. So that means we're continuing to prepare. We're going out and hiring experts. We're getting ready for a day trial, maybe a day and a half trial in common place. That's where we are. Even though I've said, change the language here, and I will back away. Well, maybe a right to know expert could resolve mm -hmm. that. Maybe we won't have well, to. Well, then I, I would think it would be much, much cheaper to hire to get an attorney that understands the right to know act. That's what I suggest. To try and negotiate this out so that it possibly could resolve this. If you get the common place court, I've worked in the court system quite a while, it's going to be really expensive, there's no doubt about it. And you're apt to not get a decision that's satisfactory. And who wants to go to court with your supervisor? Not us. We don't. Albert. <laughs> this, is, this is really odd, and I've worked for government for a number of years. The, the government is my employer, and as a, re, as a result, you become basically my employer. But there's certain information you're not entitled to. Mm -hmm. The law says so. You're not entitled to the police records, except who gets arrested. You're entitled to how much I work, how much I drive, all that type of thing. And in this case, Lisa and I are in the same position. The personnel records, mine included, are not public records. No. So there is a, you're really <coughs> restricted on what you release as personnel records. I had a number of them in there, and, and we're in the same situation. What we're looking for is clarification here, so that the public understands what myself or Lisa cannot release. This is what we're really looking for. Good. Well put. Thank you. Yeah. Well put. Mr. Well, Chairman, I submit that, uh, first of all, these, I don't think the question on the floor is to make these records public. The question on the floor is to give access to the three of you, uh, total access to all financial records, including expenditures for the human resources area. And uh, I think one question that either a right to know attorney or some other counsel has to answer is are you three truly the employers of township employees? I think you are because you have the right to hire and fire. So I think the one question any attorney has to answer is are you in fact the employer where I worked in the corporate world? <coughs> a whole bunch of people who were working for the employer Above me and below me knew my personal information. Well, Bill, um, to answer, the, answer the, the first part, um, we three supervisors have unfettered access to financial records and personnel records. We do not have any access to medical records. Insofar as establishing employer employee relationship, that was established very fairly in, I'm going to guess, 2007. We are the employer when we pay a person and give them a W-2. Okay, well I think all these questions need to be answered by a right to know attorney. We don't know the answer. And, and we, will, we will endeavor to get someone here in place next. And, and while next you're on that subject of right time. to know, I would really request that the supervisors think about putting somebody else with the right to know officer instead of me. Okay, any other comments? Uh, hearing none, I move we adjourn. Mm -hmm. yep. Is there a second? Do you want to pay bills? Uh, <laughs> we will pay bills. We will pay bills. Well, um, and after we pay our bills, we will adjourn. <laughs> <laughs>